Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, Friedrich von Hayek's uh, political philosophy. There is no question that Hayek uh, is uh, the best known of the um, Austrian economists, uh, the most influential one, however much we admire and respect the others. He is the only one who has uh, received the Nobel Prize in uh, economics and he inspired both Ronald Reagan and Margaret Hudson. I was fortunate enough to get to know Hayek and he told me the story of uh, the first encounter with Mrs. Satsa after she had formed the government in May 1979. She had been reading his works with great pleasure in the, in the previous years. And when she heard that he was uh, staying in London, where he always stayed at the Reform Club, the Week Club, Old Week Club, uh, she invited him to 10 Downing Street. And she greeted him in the, uh, in the entrance of 10 Downing Street and said to him, Professor Hayek, I know precisely what you are going to say. You are going to say that I haven't done enough, and you are absolutely right. And thus, uh, Mrs. Satsa disarmed Hayek, and he told me that he was a great admirer of her, and that his only worry was that um, she didn't really have a majority in her own party. And Ronald Dragon, of course, was also uh, an admirer of Hayek. It's interesting if we think about, if we reflect upon the last century, that perhaps four names encapsulate uh, the last century. The first one is Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution. The second one is uh, Hitler. The third one is Keynes in this uh, period of peace and economic growth and expansion of the state from 1950 to 1975. But then, with the collapse of communism, I think Hayek might be uh, a label for the last quarter of the 20th century. Now, uh, my uh, proposal here, or thesis, or idea, or suggestion is that perhaps Hayek was more Mengerian than Misesian. Of course, uh, Hayek, Mises, and Menga were all Austrians, uh, subjectivists, uh, classical liberals. But he may have been closer to, uh, to Menga than to Mises. And uh, I think that fact is obscured by, by uh, him being extremely reluctant to criticize uh, Mises uh, uh, publicly, or, or also rather privately. He always kept, uh, uh, kept his... Uh, his uh, friends with uh, Mises. Mises was really a, an economist, e economist. A friend of mine, Samuel Husband, who was a stockbroker in San Francisco and a uh, libertarian, he told me that he had been uh, Mises' host uh, on his last lecture tour in San Francisco. Uh, it was uh, just before he uh, passed away, Mises. And they were driving in Broadway in San Francisco, where there's a lot of strip joints and the market for Mises was with uh, Mises and some husbands, and Mises was in fact dozing up in the back seat, being very old. And then market for Mises saw the strip uh, joints and said, Lou, Lou, look uh, uh, over the window, a lot of naked ladies. And uh, Ludwig of Mises woke up and said, bad for the clothing industry. <laughs> so he, he was somebody who never forgot that he was, uh, he was an economist. And Hayek's uh, reluctance to criticize Mises was, of course, uh, quite justified because there were enough other people doing it. And Mises was an intellectual hero who stood up against uh, most of the others. He was a voice in the wilderness. So he deserved uh, our admiration, even if we may not agree with him uh, or with Hayek. I will actually come to that a little bit later. Uh, so, uh, I think you can characterize uh, Mises as a rationalist, whereas uh, Menger and uh, Hayek are evolution evolutionists who are very keenly aware of individual ignorance. Uh, and uh, Menger, in his Untersuchungen, he asked really a crucial question about the social sciences. How can it be that institutions which serve the common welfare and are extremely significant for its development come into being without the common will directed toward establishing them? 
And the examples uh, he gave were, of course, as people here are familiar with, money, the law, markets, and the state. Uh, interestingly, because Mises was a utilitarian, quite a rationalistic uh, utilitarian, Menger rejected uh, utilitarianism he, as being the not infrequently impetuous effort to get away with what exists, what, with what is not sufficiently understood. Uh, this is really what William Graham Sumner later called the absurd attempt to make the world over. This is uh, <coughs> what uh, Menger was criticizing. And Menger added that this kind of uh, utilitarianism, utilitarianism led, contrary to uh, the intention of its uh, representatives, inexorably to socialism. Now, it is interesting um, why that would be the case and why it is that both Menga and Hayek saw uh, socialism less as an alternative political position but rather as an intellectual error. What kind of an intellectual error is socialism? Well, there is uh, one thing that uh, Daisy and uh, Mr. Friedman and others uh, have been uh, pointing out. And it is that if we uh, consider situations on their own merits and not in the light of general principles, then we are led to interventionism and finally to socialism. This is one argument. Another argument is, and it comes through in, in, in Manga, that uh, socialism may be a failure to distinguish between purposeful institutions, such as private companies, and purposeless and spontaneous orders, such as language and the market. And if you don't distinguish between those two, then you may be led to a demand for the rational reconstruction of society, because you overestimate individual reason and you underestimate the reason which is embodied in institutions. And we have to, uh, we have to recall that such uh, orders, even though, even though they may be purposeless, they are not pointless. In fact, they are extremely useful. And uh, for Menger, of course, uh, the uh, market is a process in time subject to individual ignorance. This makes uh, both Menger and Hayek skeptical about individual reason and its uh, capacity to recreate society. So that's where the conservative instincts uh, enter. But it's interesting also that Menger, in his Untersuchungen, he criticized uh, the German historical school for being unable rationally to evaluate uh, traditions. And in fact, this is what Karl Popper, I had a very interesting conversation a uh, whole day with Karl Popper once, and he said to me, I loved Hayek, he saved my life, but I'm critical uh, of his uh, evolutionism. He has no tool, Popper said, to distinguish properly between good and bad traditions. One of them, Popper said to me, was a caste system in India. You know, it is really a tradition in Indian society, but it's a tradition that we want to get rid of. It's a bad tradition. So that was his argument. And that's a little bit like uh, Menger's argument against the German historical school. So um, I think that what we have in uh, Hayek and Papa is the liberal research program, which is essentially to make the invisible hand visible, namely to explain spontaneous orders to explain the unintended results of the actions of many men. And uh, the contrast is to uh, conspiracy theories or hidden hands explanations, as Nutzis calls, calls it. And uh, <clears throat> totalitarianism, uh, totalitarianism was mentioned here before, and couples and so on. If you're a socialist, you always have to ascribe bad situations to bad people. Uh, the uh, communists do it to capitalists, and the Nazis did it to the Jews. And uh, one example in uh, modern discourse is, of course, income distribution, which is the outcome of uh, ch choices and not the choice it itself. It's a category error to look upon income distribution as an activity of any human being. <clears throat> 
So we have, as a result of these insights that Menger and uh, Hayek offer us, something that I've called conservative liberalism. It is not re really conservatism as a noun, because Hayek agrees with Menger that we cannot distinguish between bad and good traditions, even if Popper directed that uh, cr critique against him. But it is conservative in its respect for traditions and awareness of the limitations of individual reason, which is a typical conservative uh, position. The question is how the marvelous uh, civilization of the West uh, uh, was and is possible despite individual ignorance. And the answer that Hayek and Menka give is the transformation and creation of knowledge made possible by price and traditions. I think this is an extremely powerful political f f philosophy and position. So uh, I, um, I became uh, a disciple of Hayek and I wrote my dissertation at Oxford University on Hayek and he was very happy with us being interested in his ideas. So he came to us and had dinner with us. And he gave a little speech at the end of the dinner. And in the speech he said, I'm very happy that you are uh, uh, developing and criticizing my theories. But I have to make you make one promise. I have noticed that the Marxists are much worse than Marx and that the Keynesians are much worse than Keynes so please do not become Hayekians. <laughs> Maintain your critical faculties. And even if I'm sympathetic to Hayek, I also try to criticize him. Thank you very much. So, have we any questions? Anyone who is Hayekian? Thank you very much, Hannes, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I agree with you completely about <clears throat> Menger and Hayek. Um, and I, I must uh, renounce my Hayekianism immediately so that <laughs> I'm not suspect. However, um, I'm sympathetic to Hayek, but I do want to ask if you have an answer to the question that you posed, that Popper had posed to Hayek. Do you think that Hayek had the tools to distinguish between good and bad traditions? I actually believe that we have to uh, use a concept which um, John Rawls, the political philosopher, introduced, which is a reflective equilibrium. We do have to have uh, uh, respect for traditions, but uh, to maintain the facility to criticize them. And in fact, if you look at Hayek's uh, very interesting essay, Why I'm Not a Conservative, uh, that, that is his main objection to conservatism, that they lack moral principles with which to criticize a present reality, so they would have to go along with what is uh, the tradition in each and every society. But at the same time, you have to be respectful of tradition and know and uh, respect the old adage. Um, when it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. My question is about the good and bad traditions, or maybe is it is it not a fatal conceit to claim that we know which traditions are good and which traditions are bad? The very notion of good and bad is something that is a result of this cultural revolution. And what may seem a good tradition today will not look a good tradition three or four or five hundred years ago. In other words, who says that the caste system is a bad tradition. I don't think that we can have the authority to claim that. Unless we, or unless a better system emerges, not is designed. Well, I think that um, the answer to this is that Hayek uh, perhaps did not understand fully enough what Michael Oakeshott uh, pointed out, that uh, liberalism or the respect for uh, uh, individual liberty is not really a principle that we find a priori, priori and uh, then uh, uh, implement on a society. It is the product of uh, traditions and, uh, the, uh, and uh, uh, the experience of, 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 of many generations. However, 
we may stand back and reflect upon it and see the points in it. And that's what Edmund Burke admonished us to do, to see the point in traditions. And if we do not see the points in them, then we may reject them. But Hayek would, of course, add also that um, there is a selection of traditions that go on because some traditions are vastly more successful than others such as the liberal uh, tradition of the West, uh, it, it really is. But then, uh, if we are going to maintain that, we have to maintain the will to defend it. Uh, and uh, that uh, may be lacking, at least in, in, in Europe at our times, and why should we defend it? Well, I think uh, there, there comes the reflective equilibrium. We respect the tradition, but we also see that it's a good tradition. We look into the mirror and we like what we see. That is to say, we assert our identity as uh, human beings that have acquired the ability and will to make choices. Perhaps the, the first individuals in Western civilization of, of this kind would be Romeo oh, and Juliet in Shakespeare's uh, play. He was an individualist. What did they do? They went out of the, of the traditional framework of their families, the Montagues and uh, Capulets, and began to love each other. And this is what Jacob Burkhardt, in his wonderful book about the Italian Renaissance, points out, that individuality was in some ways created or born or articulated there in Renaissance Italy. I was very much uh, astonished of the expression that markets are purposeless and spontaneous. In my mind, markets are neither purp purposeless nor spontaneous. You already said not pur uh, a purposeless, yes, but not pointless. I would say not purposeless because the purpose of the market is very clear indeed. That's to exchange goods. And this is a purpose. It's not only pointless, as you said, it is a purpose. This is the purpose of markets to exchange goods. And the second is, it is also not spontaneous. It may have been natural, to some extent it is spontaneous, uh, before 10,000 years ago. But Walter Eucken, whom I admire very much, who was the head of the Freiburg School and the Ordo uh, Liberals and so on and so forth, he said, markets have to be created. There has to be a legal framework. It was very important to have an anti-cartel law to abolish or at least to restrain monopolies and so. So markets are not uh, entirely spontaneous to some extent, yes? They have to be created. I'm very much on the side of the Freiburg or the liberal schools who saw market not so spontaneous as maybe Hayek has seen it. Well, uh, this is a very interesting point, but I think it could be uh, re responded to by pointing out uh, that uh, we may distinguish between uh, individual markets, which certainly have a purpose, which is to exchange goods to mutual benefit, and the market order, by which we mean also the legal framework of the market, uh, such as property rights. But was, was that created? I think it was actually brought about in a spontaneous uh, uh, development. Uh, essentially, what we had in, in Europe in the Middle Ages and uh, so on was a civilization of, of city-states and uh, weak government powers stretching all the way from northern Italy through Switzerland uh, and the Netherlands to England. And uh, that's where all the... Um, all the progress took place, and uh, that's where uh, the cradle of Western civilization as we know it now, and capitalism was basically, and I don't think anyone intended it. It was the unintended outcome of some historical forces, including weak government power and a strong middle class and the freedom to trade and merchant uh, fleets uh, and, and so on in, in the West. Thus, I believe capitalism was born. I think we have not time for any more questions. Thank you very much.